So hi everybody and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Shona Mortier. I'm the director of the Center for Civil Society. I'm introducing Andres Motau and Danford Chibon Godze who facilitate the seminar series. And today we are very excited to welcome Professor Nathan Andrews. And the focus of his seminar is um, aligned to our special seminar series where we've been reflecting on the resource curse. Last week, we had an activist from the Amadiba Crisis Committee talking about the curse of titanium in the Eastern Cape province in South Africa. And today, Professor Andrews is inviting us to think beyond the resource, resource curse. And I see he's got a question mark there. So he's asking us about that. Um, his focus is going to be oil, globalized assemblages and development with a case study of Ghana. Um, Professor Andrews, Professor Andrews is Associate Professor of Global and International Studies at the University of Northern British Columbia, um, where he's recently received prestigious awards and excellence in research award. His focus is on, internet, on the international political economy of resource extraction. So this is um, an area of speciality for him and global development, but he's also interested in questions around oppression, academic dependency, and decolonization in higher education. Uh, we're going to be joined a little bit later by the Dean of our school, the School of Built Environment and Development Studies, uh, Professor Ernest Khalima, who's going to be saying a little bit more about um, the seminar topic as well as about uh, Professor Andrews. So we will hear from him a bit later. But for now, I think I'm going to hand over to Danford, who's facilitating today. Nathan, we just want to make sure that we have your permission to record this seminar because uh, we have a YouTube channel. And what we do is we upload these webinars to that YouTube channel for people who couldn't make it um, at the seminar time. You know, there are various reasons why people don't make it. And the YouTube channel is then another option for them. So do we have your permission? We are recording, but we can stop recording if you're not comfortable. It's okay. Uh, you Sorry, need to yeah, that's fine with me, yeah. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Dan, I'm handing over to you now to facilitate. Um, Dan, you just need to um, bear in mind that Professor Halema wants to say a few words at some point. So you need to filter that in. I, I, I think, I suspect he might be having trouble connecting or something. I'll check. Okay, uh, that's fine, Shona. Thank you so much, uh, Shona, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Andrews. Uh, I've already introduced myself. My name is Danford, but I'll introduce myself again. My name is Danford Chifongo uh, I'm a researcher uh, here at the Center for Civil so so Society at the University of Wazul Natal. So I'm going to give you approximately 30 minutes uh, to give us your presentation. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentation and to engage with you later on. So um, the house rules, uh, may you please uh, mute your mics and also um, uh, mute your videos um, so that we can have maybe good connections and everything. And um, uh, if you want to raise uh, a point uh, during the Q&A section, please uh, make sure that um, you raise a virtual hand so that I can recognize you. If you have any questions, uh, you can uh, drop them for, 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 for Nathan. You can drop them in the chat box and then I'll, 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 I'll read out uh, the, the questions. So over to you, uh, Professor Andrews. Um, we are looking forward uh, to hear your, your research. Uh, in uh, uh, the oil case. Thank, thank you again. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan Ford. And thank you, Shauna, for the nice introduction. I, I would just um, start sharing my screen if I can find where it is here. Um, one minute. I have my PowerPoint here. But it's been really great um, to have this opportunity to share my research. And I'm hoping that I should be able to deal with this within 30 minutes. Uh, <laughs> If, if, if not a little bit over there, but I'll try. So the, the, the focus is on, you know, the resource curse. I'm not so much into the resource curse. My, my, my goal here is to question how we, we think about the resource curse and in, in the context of, um, you know, extraction 
in 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 different parts of the world but also the, the focus here is on ghana but it has it has connections with other parts of the world so hopefully we can broaden the discussions as as as, as we go and and once i'm done and we get into the q a um the, the, we know that resources um are important and i have to mention that this presentation today is coming out of um a book that my colleague and i Pius Yakwa, who is at the University of Ghana, um, and I published, um, which came out early on in this year. So the findings are pretty much already in the book. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, highlight some of the key things that we were able to find from that discussion, from, from that research. But I wanted to just briefly frame this discussion around the resource development nexus, the connection between the two. So even though there has been the need to shift away from um, non-renewable natural resources, um, they still remain a bedrock. If you look at hydrocarbon, for instance, right, they still remain a bedrock of the global economy. So that sort of highlights the importance and why the notion of a resource curse or resource dependence has been around for um, a few decades now. I mean, several decades, actually. Um, and and it's, it's, it's still still hanging around us because there's a real connection. And most countries are relying on natural resources for you know, substantial rents um, in the contributions to GDP and their national income. So that's sort of a, a way in which you can understand why you know, connect oil, for instance, is connected to development in a context of Ghana, because I mean, Ghana developed, um, discovered oil pretty later on. Um, the actual discovery was in 2007. Production did not commence until 2010, um, but it, it's 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 really become like a boom, and people are relying on that to to address all the problems that the country is facing. Which I challenge, uh, we we challenge in this book um, because <laughs> you, you cannot just rely on one um, aspect of the economy to to sort of resolve resolve all the problems that you've been facing, right? So just a brief about the methodology and how we went about. Um, and I didn't have a whole slide on it because I just wanted to briefly touch on this. Um, this work is is informed by in-depth qualitative research that we conducted um, between 2014 and 2016 in Ghana's um, coastal communities. So these, these communities are neighboring um, the oil establishments uh, because we have off offshore oil establishments in the context of Ghana. And we managed to speak to over 140 um, people and you know, engage them in, 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 in the research in terms of focus groups um, and also interviews, and we did some observations on the fields um, ourselves as we went. So that's sort of the brief in terms of what we did, but I could get more into methodology if anyone is interested in, in that kind of question. So the, the, the reason why I'm very cr critical of the resource curse thesis is the methodological nationalism that comes with the premise that the resource curse is um, a political problem, right? And, 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 and it's pretty much an issue of bad governance. Um, or in some cases, they see it as an economic problem, which results from bad, um, sort of bad, poor management, poor economic management, um, because they, it, it's pretty much conceptualized as such. And that's how the idea of the resource care. And this is based on res um, research that research evidence from the late 80s and early 90s. And, and we know all the usual suspects, um, Alti, Carl, um, we have Sachs and Warner. All these uh, publications sought to sort of depict the host state as being liable for the eventual outcomes of resource extraction. So for instance, they say that, well, if, if resources don't result in economic um, development, then there has to be something wrong with the system. There has to be something wrong with the host um, state and, and how it does, it, 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 it operates because that would have implications for what you can, you can get out of it. So I think for me, and, and, and for, for me and my, and my co-author, we, 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 we argue that a state-centric focus really fails to capture the broader dynamics, um, you know, the different dis dis disjunctures and, you know, the sort of wider globalized assemblage of actors and power structures, institutions and political considerations that are involved in understanding the extent to which resources can become um, useful for any country's development or not. Um, so that's that's sort of our main premise. So the resource case and globalized assemblage theorizing, we we sought to dwell on actor network theory and also to to draw from assemblage perspectives that are connected to actor network theory in order to bring out the relational 
nature of the resource development nexus. And re what we mean by relational is, you know, if you think of um, the ontology of actor network theory, the, the understanding is that the local is very much global and, and the global is local. So really there's no way of disentangling the two, right? So what you think is, is local is actually not just local. It's because there's already an entanglement. Um, of, of the global with the local and, and vice versa. So that's how we see it. And that, that really complicates our understanding of how resources materialize um, for development or not. Um, so this the sort of notion of act of disentanglement happens where they, in the case of oil, we think of oil as, you know, so having this enclave nature, right? And it, it's, it, it seems to create this spatial dimension where there's some distance between the sector and its wider implications. So when I when we go to the field and talk to an oil officials, they'll say, well, this is an offshore oil company. We don't have anything to do with the communities per se. We don't have a direct impact. We still do what we do to help them, but we don't have a direct impact. That's how they perceive themselves, right? Perceive that if I'm not next to a community, like, 50 meters or 100 meters or you know, whatever, 500, and I'm actually offshore because basically they feel like the sea separates them from the, the land and from the people. So that sort of disentanglement really creates um, a problem where the, the industry thinks that its impacts are not directly felt by the people. So but the, if, if you think of the assemblage perspective, um, you would see that it, it's it's really not about distance, right? It's not about distance. It's about sort of the, the, the wider impacts that you would have, no matter how far you think you are. Because here I'm talking about even globalized assemblage where you have actors from overseas who may not actually be directly operating in the, in the coastal community, but are still having an impact on what is happening in the coastal community, but also in the country as a whole, in terms of the connections between oil, and, and development. So there's this real connection um, in, in, in the way we see the, the, the different actors and the different systems that operate within that, that context. So that's, that's how we conceptualize it. So this is how we came out with sort of unpacking the globalized assemblage. And in, in, the, in, the, in the typical resource curse literature, you will see a bit more about politics and a bit more about economics. There's, there's hardly anything written about the environmental aspect of the resource curse per se, but I mean, I know uh, Michael Watts and a few others have written about it, but it's not as widespread in, in, in the scholarship. And also the social aspect, the way we theorize the social assemblage hasn't really been theorized in the resource curse um, thesis. And that's how we sought to bring all, bringing all these three, that you know, sort of four dimensions, um, two of which we already know about in the typical resource curse, um, but even extending beyond what we know about um, sort of six, seems to be our contribution, um, it, core contribution um, of, of, of the book. So in the book, you see that this, um, this um, you know, illustration is much more you know, interesting because it has all these um, arrows pointing to, to, to the sites. Um, of course, I was trying to transpose it to um, PowerPoint and, and, and the arrows vanished for some reason. <laughs> so, but we are trying to we, we make a connection between um, the, the social to the political, to the economic, to the environment and the globalized assemblage really connects everything together. So that, that the rest of the presentation is gonna be focused on these four dimensions and the various attributes that make up um, these different dimensions that constitute what we see as a globalized assemblage um, in, in the context of um, Ghana. So the, for the political assemblage, we know that um, with the resource case theory would say, well, institutions, when institutions are grabber friendly, which is when they are prone to corruption and rent seeking tendencies, right? It means that you know, the, the, the outcomes of resources would, would, would be limited. Um, in, in terms of its connection to national income or GDP and all of that. And of, of course, there, there's also the notion of political settlement, which deals with comp competitive clientelism, the notion that, you know, people go into office so they can get money um, to, you know, for their own pocket, but also um, for, 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 for their cronies and, and for the people that, is, that support them, that's, that, that have supported them to get to where they are. So there's sort of a social economy that has been supported um, by the way things are done in, within the context of, of, of Ghana, but also widely um, in, in other parts of, of, of the continent as well. So that, that, that was very clear. And that's sort of the political assemblage, right? And that's a typical 
um, resource scarce understanding that, well, if these things are in place, if there is, you know, clientelism and there, there are political settlements to, 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 be, to be done, then it would have an impact on how much money would end up actually going into um, the hands of the average person who may not be part of the political elite or who, who may not be connected to, to these politicians in any way. What we also discovered, and we don't really dwell so much on this in that chapter, but later on after, after we finish, I, I, I came up with this sort of understanding that when you think of governance interdependence, which really in the context of Ghana is informed by three really relational trends, um, which we see as an elite consensus towards neoliberal norms, right? That, you know, the elites understand that we need to put in place these mechanisms um, these mechanisms are supposed to help appease all sorts of actors, that they appease the World Bank or they appease international organizations, but also appease some local actors who are expecting the government to be pursuing those things, right? Um, another aspect of this complexity is the fact that there is a culture of participatory decision making. Um, so civil society organizations have been allowed, for the most part, to really be involved. Um, to be part to by participating in different institutions. If you look at the extractive industries transparency initiative, for instance, civil society is playing a, a primary role where we have um, a current um, co-chair being a civil society activist, right? And, and it's, it's really interesting. The government is giving room for, for that to happen. Um, and, and critics will say, well, all of this is meant to sort of help the government do other things. So by allowing these things to happen, um, there's sort of an interdependence, um, which which is pretty much governed in a way to allow the you know the the, the the political elites to be able to do certain things that they want to do. So in a way, okay, we look at all these great things we're doing, um, and then they are doing other things on the side. We in a way sort of to shy away from the 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 corruption or maybe the rent seeking that that would be happening. There's also critical inputs from local communities that are being allowed, um, and and it's it's really informed by decades of local government, um, government reforms, which really have an, an ensured that locals are able to participate for the most part, even though in our own, in our own research, we notice that people feel, well, well what is the point? We, we talk, but we don't really see any impact. We go to meetings, but it doesn't really reflect um, you know, positively in our lives, right? So that's, that's really an interesting comment. Um, to, to continue with the political assembly, the way we see it as an assemblage is that you know, institutions are enacted by humans, for instance. And so the humans are able to shape um, these structures um, and they're able to shape how things are done, right? So that's, that's it, it's not, it's, an institution is not just something that is sitting there and you're expecting it to change. You and, and, and I and every person that is part of, 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 of the institution or part of the country um, or part of a particular system is able to contribute to it. But what we notice as a political assemblage, which is sort of globalized also, there's a boom in global governance, in, in good governance, in innovations, which have been orchestrated by a number of institutions. So there's a civil society platform on oil and gas. And I did mention earlier that civil society, um, you know, organizations have been instrumental in the oil sector in Ghana. Um, and, and that it, you can see from the establishment of this platform, right, that they, 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 they got established once oil became, um, you know, a thing in Ghana from 2007 onwards. Um, but I mean, this is not to say that the platform was already not in the pipes, because I mean, they're already connected to a number of activities, such as Publish What You Pay, which had been in place. Um, and, and, and all these organizations, think of the UNDP and what it is doing in the context of Ghana. So all of these actors are playing an instrumental role and the, and the World Bank, for instance, is also playing an instrumental role in what is happening in the political sphere. And here politics are referring to institutions and what they are doing to build capacity of, of, of these government institutions so that oil will be managed properly. So what the, the argument we are making is, well, if we have all of these actors playing a role, how would you then blame just one actor? How would you then become state-centric by saying that, well, if everything goes wayward, then it is pretty much the fault of the state. Um, and and you, you, the state is to blame, poor governance is to blame, um, but then who really facilitates that poor governance, right? Um, all these actors are part of it. So if poor governance happens, then all of these actors should be part of solving it all, should be part of, you know, taking the blame 
for poor governance. Now let's move into the economic assemblage. Um, I see that I'm going to be running a lot out of time. Um, the, the, Dutch, the Dutch disease is considered to be a phenomenon where, you know, and, and, and you know, the, the, a boom in an extractive sector topples other sectors of the economy, right? So this this really happened um, in, in, in the Netherlands. But it's, it's, it's really seemed to be one of the major effects. So the Dutch disease seemed to have a spending effect, including borrowing inflation and exchange rates. Um, there's also this notion of lack of diversification, de-industrialization and de-agriculturalization, which happens as a result of having a boom in a particular extractive sector. Um, so oil in Ghana actually contributed just about 10% to GDP um, since production commenced. And it was interesting for us to find that, because um, we're trying to see if, well, this notion of the Dutch disease and this notion of oil outpacing other sectors is really real. So we have to track um, annual growth rates by sector over a span of eight years. I mean, that's all we could, that's how far we could go. Um, and and we, we, we noticed that except um, in 2017, where oil, um, the percentage of, of, of you know, oil vis-a-vis um, -vis growth rate um, was about 80%. The rest of the time, other sectors were, were equally thriving as oil was thriving. So it really wasn't a major boom the way it is perceived. I mean, in, in, in 2017, I think one of the reasons why it, it shot up was they, 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 they were, there were new discoveries, right? New discoveries. And so that sort of led to some sort of a boom. And I think the global commodity market was quite good at that time too. Um, but, you know, global commodity markets keep going up and down. One thing we also sought to do was the distribution of GDP by economic activity. Oil as a percentage of GDP. You could see that from 2010 all the way till 2018, it's not significant. That's why I gave um, the 10% as, as an estimate, but even within this, uh, you don't even see 10%, even though that's what we usually talk about in the context of Ghana, that this is around 10%, eight to 10%. But over a span of eight years, you could see that other sectors of the economy, agriculture, industry, and services are still contributing significantly more to um, economic activity than oil is. So that makes us question the, the notion of, um, economics and economic governance um, really contributing to understanding of the resource scarce and how govern, you know, poor economic management would be something that the state has done, right? What we saw though, in terms of the globalized system is the connection to the globalized capitalist economy that even though all these economic measures are put in place to ensure that oil does not become the boom, um, the booming economy, at a disadvantage of other sectors of the economy. Um, there is still the, the oil and, and the oil industry is inserted into this, this global economy, capitalist economy, which one of the one of our respondents characterized as a sort of a game of unequals, right? So it fluctuates, the prices will fluctuate, and, and all kinds of considerations happen at the global level, which would impact how oil um, would, would have real you know, material effect for people on the ground. Um, so there's a sort of um, globalized assemblage and globalization as, as we characterize this. One, one, one of my colleagues would call it sort of the overabundance of regulatory inf influences. And I remember I did mention, I did highlight World Bank in a previous slide. Well, the World Bank in particular is contributing, um, at this point, I think it's over $55 million um, dollars towards the capacity building um, projects. And so out of that, they were able to establish new institutions that were supposed to help deal with, you know, certain bureaucratic gaps that existed in, in the sector, right? So what, what, what we are arguing here is that a state-centric generalization of the economic attributes of the resource curse is not accurate because it's not pretty much state-centric. Um, there are so many other actors um, involved in the, in the economic aspect. So even if something goes wrong, it's of course domestically something someone is you know some institution is, is is falling apart or not doing what they're supposed to do but these institutions are all inserted within a broader um globalized um economy which informs the outcome um of of, of extraction so for the social assemblage which is quite um we saw this to be a quite a unique contribution because we see the social embeddedness of hydrocarbon economies because i mean we see actors as being defined by their relations, right? So the way you associate would, 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 would have a connection to 
the broader sectors that you, you are part of. So agency matters. And so we sought to look at agency at the subnational, local, community level. And of course, our, our interviews were with um, government officials, um, but also um, with, with corporations themselves. So we sort of look at how these different agents in the social sphere are contributing um, to how oil materializes for development or not. So we, 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 we characterize this as different channels of inclusion. And we saw the corporation as being sort of the social stimulus and that we consider corporation as a social stimulus because corporation plays a, a, a big role in the context of Ghana. And like I mentioned, even though they seek to disentangle themselves from the real effect of oil, they still contribute substantially to corporate social responsibility initiatives. And, and, and they, they, they do employ you know, locals for the most part, locals, and sometimes who, those that are considered locals are actually not locals. Um, and, and they spend quite a bit of money on development projects, right? So in a way, all of these projects are supposed to spark some amount of development or some kind of development in these local settings. Uh, well, the question is really, do people feel that they are part of the process of developing these initiatives, they're part of the process of implementing them or not? Um, but not, but, but I mean, that's, that's a question that we cannot probably address right now. Um, if you think of the, the reason why I think the corporations are playing a key role in the social sphere is also the, 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 their connection to the sustainable development goals right now. You have all these corporations coming out with all sorts of, um, reports about how their work contributes to, um, the SDGs and, and, and they try to align their work with the SDGs, which I think is a great thing because it's a global goals. But then because they are inserted in that, everything they're doing at a local level is actually connected to a global development um, regime, which really has, has, has a connection to um, things such as the, the global compact, right? which has been in place um, since um, the, the, the early 2000s. And so all of these connections show that you have this wider assemblage of global of, of global of, of global social actors, and we call them social actors, I mean, they're also political actors. So in the context of Ghana, so one sector alone, you have the NIDA, you have USAID, you have UK aid, you have DFID, you have the German Corporation, you have the European Union. All of these actors are playing a role. I mean, I can tease out what they are individually doing, uh, maybe in the Q&A, but for instance, the DFID has set up this organization called the Western Coast, um, the Western Region Coastal Foundation. And what they're supposed to do is to encourage citizen um, participation in, 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 in shared benefits. So basically sort of a, a stakeholder um, organization that's supposed to bring people together to share ideas to 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 present what 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 could be changed and to try to address them right so all of these organizations are interested and I'm wondering why they are all so interested in 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 citizen participation in a country that is not theirs but it's, and again if if something goes wrong then the, the blame is actually not like they haven't done much what did what they seek to do again what they see themselves as doing is contributing to the positive aspect. Of, of engagement and participation and not so much the negative. So the our critique is that, well, if you're contributing this much and if you are in, uh, this involved, then if something goes wrong, you have to also question your role and what you've been doing and whether what you've been doing really adds up to anything or maybe even makes matters, um, think, may, may, makes things quite a bit worse um, in, in some contexts, right? But this is really not the consideration. It's always like we see these actors as being benevolent actors, being, you know, there to to make things to improve things um but i would I, we would argue that it's not always the case and actually having too many of these actors in in, in one space uh, it, it conflates how um the outcomes of, of extraction become ma materialized you know for 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 people right and, and it's, it's just too many actors now for the environmental aspect we we what we encountered was just a connection between oil and people's livelihoods just really clear connection um, and what we consider to be environmental injustice. The fact that people who used to live in Uno and, 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 and fish, um, for instance, fish um, where, where now we have oil extraction, we have you know, these offshore installations, are not able to get to that point where they could actually fish. They have to now think of other ways or other directions they could, they could sail their boat. And that is a problem. And even when they could get anything they could get far to, to even try to get any any fish which really sustains their livelihood um, they come back with 
you know, all kinds of weeds and, and destroyed nets. And I mean, the science behind it is quite interesting because the people are blaming the oil, you know, the offshore oil you know, production for, for, for bringing out all the weeds, right? I mean, of course, we know that there's, there's, there's um, a waste problem on, on, on many oceans, um, on many co coasts. But I think in this case, we know that there's some connection between, you know, all the seaweed that is coming out of the, you know, from the seafloor you know, and, and, and how all those get entangled, you know, and, and how the fish get attracted to the, the, the oil rig in a way that, you know, limits the, the chances of local fishers getting access to the fish that they used to get access to. So that's the sort of clear connection that, you know, we were able to establish without in, in our conversations with, with people on the ground. So if you look at the environmental assemblage, and this is um, probably my last few slides, um, we, we, we connect what, the, what is happening at the local level government to what is happening um, and, and, and sort of the involvement of transnational oil corporations, for instance. So in, at the local level, you see that, well, there's obviously some lacks in, you know, in, in implementing environmental policy, right? And I think there's, as I mentioned, there's a sort of governed interdependence and sort of a deliberate neoliberal orientation um, towards the economic aspect or the economic attributes of the industry. So the oil is going to bring us benefit. Oil is going to contribute 10% plus to GDP, so let's make it work um, for, the, for the most part, right? So by, by doing so, the government or the state seems sort of unable or unwilling to implement or enforce certain regulations that will safeguard communities whose lives will be at, at risk uh, because they cannot access things that they used to access anymore. For instance, cannot access the, um, the ocean for, for fishing. Um, or they can, but they wouldn't be able to get enough because of the obstructions that they face when they go out, right? So you can connect that to, of course, oil spills that you know, Ghana has experienced even within the, the, the past decade of oil extraction um, and, and the enactment of restricted um, zones of, of, you know, zones, of, zones of, um, of, of extraction where you can actually get close. So you can only get up to 500 meters um, around the, the vessels. And, and that's a problem, right? And, and the reason why I see this as a globalized assemblage also, you can think of distant water fishing companies. And here we're getting into sort of bigger complex um, pictures where you think of Chinese distant water fishing companies and not just Chinese, but from other parts of the world, they are able to bring in boats that are able to go farther, that are able to do more and able to, to, ex to get more fish than the locals would be able to get. So that's, that's a problem in a way that it disadvantages the locals who are, who are just using you know, traditional boats to, be, to, to fish for, for livelihood and, and just for, for the maintenance of, of, of their, their households. So that, 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 that creates a problem for the locals that are dependent on that sort of activity for their lives, for, the, for, the, for their livelihood. You can also connect this back to the nested politics that happens um, at, at, the, at the local level. Um, where you know you have the, the queen mothers, you have the chief fishermen, the traditional authority, and all the sort of politics that they are engaged in, right? So it, it's really interesting when, when you think of the globalized assembly. So the, here I'm, I'm looking at we, we, what, what we sought to do was to unpack the fact that, well, it is not really a problem when a problem caused by just one entity. So here we're trying to connect the government to the transnational organizations, to global actors such as, you know, distant water fishing companies, to local politics, such as, you know, what is being done at the local level, right? Because I mean, one, one, one respondent will tell us, well, people come up with all different, you know, methods of fishing at the local level because of course they don't have access to their traditional means. And so that, would, that has an impact on, on the environment and has an impact on, what um, what fish would remain for others who are also dependent on the same resource um, for, for their livelihood. So that sort of really brings a bigger picture um, where you look at all these um, different tentacles of, 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 of extraction. So some concluding remarks, uh, we, you know, in, in this, what we sought to do sort of the empirical, to understand how the empirical manifestations of extraction, um, you know, sort of, and, 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 and how they are mutually constituted, right? So oil is entangled in all sorts of things. And so what we think is, 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 is the social um, really is glued together by 
other kinds of um, connectors. What we think is that political is glued together by other things. So there's really nothing that is sacrosanct. So the focus cannot be limited to subaltern experiences. And I mean, I've tend to do that. I've tended to do that a lot in my research where I look at, oh, how are people feeling? What, you know, because I'm looking at marginalization and social injustice. Um, but we really need to sort of look at, um, you know, how a globalized elite agency works to sustain and reproduce the curse, right? And that's, that's sort of one of our, our, our core um, argument here that, there, there is, there is a, a real globalized agency that seeks to work to sustain and reproduce um, different trends in, 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 in different contexts. And so we need to think about that. We, we, we cannot just dwell on the subaltern experiences alone um, as, as, a, as an example. So if people are poor, we say, well, they are poor because they are cursed by resources. Um, but no, they are poor because they are all of these people, all of these um, organizations globally, nationally, you know sub sub locally who you know which are involved in in making people um poor and and and, and in further impoverishing people so that's that's like a lot of people that are involved and lots of institutions and actors that are involved who may never really think of their role as impoverishing but that's 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 sort of how we need to picture it to be able to get a good understanding of how things remain the way they are over a long duration of time so just broader reflections in terms of intellectual policy contributions. We sought to sort of expand on the intersectionality of power, agency, social justice, and resistance. Now, I think we need to really question um, the agency and entanglement of the state and its implications for long-term and grassroots um, sustainable development. Because and as I said, a state is connected to so many agencies um, or agents and, 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 and wider assemblages of people, of actors, of structures of power. And so all of these would have implications for the role that a state can play in, in grassroots um, sustainable development. Also extractivism, and I think we should really question whether extractives are the way to go um, in addressing, you know, social environmental um, in, injustice. I don't think that's the way to go or even marginalization, right? So these are real problems that we need to question if extractivism can help address the developmental issues that you know, communities face. And so then we need to also think about global governance and who is involved in global governance and the role of private authority, which in this case would be oil corporations in delivering global public goods, such as poverty reduction development um, and, and, and what they can contribute, right? Because I mean, the SDGs are very much connected to what is being done widely, at, I know globally, but also at the local level and corporations are really tuning into the SDGs as a way to show that they are doing A, Z, A, A, B, or C, A, A, B, or C in, 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 this, in, in these various communities. But we need to question that, we need to interrogate that a bit more and see if that role is even a feasible role for corporations to play in the local settings. Thanks a lot. And that's where I'm gonna end and then hopefully we can have a bit of time for discussions. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 Professor Andrews, a uh, very, very interesting uh, topic um, on uh, the resource case. I think we can relate to what you are discussing here, and uh, we just uh, bundled in, in these assemblages. I think uh, it's not only a problem uh, that is uh, prevalent in, in, in Ghana. I think um, as we've had uh, a similar uh, discussions about uh, uh, DRC. Uh, we've had uh, also here in South Africa and also in Zimbabwe. So it's something that we can relate to and uh, it, it permeates uh, from the local to the national to the international uh, level. And um, I, I, I sort of uh, cringed when I saw, uh, you know, the development agencies uh, they don't have any business uh, being in our affairs, but uh, here they are uh, within this uh, entanglement of um, uh, trying to manage our resources. Uh, before maybe we can start the, the Q&A uh, 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 session, I would like to invite um, our Dean, Professor uh, Halema, to say one or two things. Um, I'm told that you were supposed to introduce uh, the speaker, but uh, you joined in late. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Professor Halema. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, for the invite. And uh, I think the work uh, of uh, Professor Andrews has introduced himself in terms of uh, what he he is uh, up has been up to. But I think the issues that uh, he has presented today, uh, as we have said, Danforth, uh, quite uh, common uh, in most African countries, particularly as we move towards uh, dealing with uh, how we can implement uh, SDGs. Uh, so for us, I think uh, 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 it's just to welcome him uh, uh, after the presentation uh, and my apologies for coming in late. However, I think we can use the remaining time uh, just to, to, um, to, to engage because some of the particular issues that he's bringing forward are quite um, uh, uh, important in our development. I remember uh, years back uh, when I was involved with uh, the cancer Ariwa case in, in Nigeria with the oil, shell oil. Uh, and we hosted quite a number of communities um, uh, who were impacted by the oil uh, extraction uh, in Ogoni land in, in Nigeria uh, and how communities came together, uh, in fact, to, to uh, speak uh, to power and to really engage uh, the multinationals in their approach. And I think what Prof. Andrews has bring, is bringing forward is that it's not only uh, the state, but also there's quite a number of actors and players that are involved. Uh, in the in disempowering communities that should be benefiting from any development that's happening based on um, uh, uh, minerals that are found on the land. So uh, for me, I just feel that this is a bigger debate uh, in the continent, but also in other parts of the world, particularly in developing countries uh, and emerging economies where uh, uh, some of these issues are brought uh, are, are happening. Sometimes they're happening within our midst, and we don't really know, uh, or we we are not quite aware. But I know the civil society uh, is at the forefront and uh, uh, of really, really exposing some of these issues. Uh, there's quite a number of things happening. I mean, there's quite a number of cases, for example, in Namibia. Uh, in Mozambique, we can go on and on. Um, and, and we need civil society to impact, to, to infect, uh, really get involved in, in educating all of us also as academics in terms of what's really, really going on. So I don't want to take enough of your time, colleagues. I think uh, we can open this discussion uh, to, eng to engaging and, and perhaps asking those specific questions uh, to our colleagues, to our colleague, uh, Professor Andrews. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Halema. If we have anyone uh, in the uh, audience who want to engage with uh, Professor Andrews, uh, please, uh, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, you can just uh, show by raising your virtual hand. Thank you. I see Prof. Uh, Mortier, you have your hand up, go ahead. Thanks so much. Nathan, thank you for that really interesting presentation. Not sure I agreed with, with you all along the way, but I also think that it was a 20 minute presentation and you possibly didn't have time to flesh out those points. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can always harass you over the email with my other things. But what I'd really like to know for today is you, you talked about the civil society assemblage. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like in Ghana? I would just be interested to know what that looks like because you can get aspects of civil society that are really quite compliant and that are really quite good at shaping, um, to use this term, a neoliberal response, a neoliberal citizen, sort of to use Wendy Brown's term. So 
I'm then, then you get, you know, you get aspects of civil society, which are hardcore. And um, for example, we spoke to uh, the Amadiba crisis committee activists last week, and they are hardcore. They were very clear about how they visualize development in their context. And that does not include mining coming in, stuffing up their ability to farm the land because water sources are poisoned and air is poisoned. And the trade off is just some crappy jobs for the short term. So for them, that is not developed. Development and they, the and they stand firm on their right to speak to what they understand as development, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense from you because Ghana is your case study and I don't know too much about that context. Mm -hmm. What, you know, what does the civil society assemblage look like? Are you talking about very well resourced and professionalized NGOs? Are you talking about social movements which have some kind of connection to their grassroots constituencies? Are you talking about community-based networks that are fluid and flexible and possibly take different forms at different times and may or may not be easily co-opted? Um, that sort of thing. I'm just trying to get a picture yeah. because I would be interested to see what it looks like. But thank you, your presentation was really lovely. Thank you very much, um, Shona, for that, those comments. I, so for the civil society assemblage in Ghana is quite interesting. So what, I, what, what we found was uh, we are actually writing a different paper on just understanding the governance boom and how these different actors are playing a role. So what we noticed was um, in understanding the role that each of these organizations play, the civil society platform on oil and gas is a platform that brings together all civil society organizations that are doing something at least remotely remate, related to the industry. Um, and I think most of them really did not have much um, to do with oil until oil became a thing. And so then they all moved to that sector, right? And became experts in, in, in trying to um, help the country address, you know, the possible negative ramifications of oil. So I think it was all sort of engineered in a way um, and then they shifted to that focus. Still, there are still civil society organizations that are focused on mining and other, other developmental issues, but oil has become so popular. And so that's why the assemblage, I was highlighting that assemblage in particular. And, and the, 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 the different organizations that are part of this, you have organizations that are funded, fully funded, um, generously funded by international um, organizations. So the DFID, you have the UK aid, you have the US aid, um, you have all of these, Danida, funding these different organizations to operate within that space. And that's why we say, well, the, the argument we're making is, well, these organizations are meant to be working within that space, the local space, but they're actually not local because the funding is not from local, from, from the local. I mean, they are not self-funded. Well, it's, it's hard to really have an organization that thrives that is self-funded, but they are, I mean, they have broader tentacles, right? So there's a lot of influences coming in from outside that is informing the things that they are doing. Um, within that context. Um, and, and the other thing is, you mentioned grassroots organizations. There are quite a few of those. But what I find is that those are not actually connected to, um, in a way, to the national politics, right? The way that, you know, you would expect them to. And I think once you have a, a, a very um, opposing view or more, you're more vocal about something that is not going right, um, you're probably likely to be excluded from how things work. So that's, 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 that's what I was able to, to, to tease out because there's an organization that I really always like to talk to, which is the WASA um, Association for Communities Against Mining. So it's called WACAM. WACAM is actually one of the best um, civil society organizations, but I don't see them represented in any of these platforms. And I don't see them included in any of these um, you know, mainstream activities that are meant to enhance um, the, the industry, for instance. So you have the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, and then they have like a national secretariat, which has a bunch of civil society organizations as part of it. So it has ISODEC, for instance. ISODEC is, 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 is really a good organization that you, you can consider it to be quite critical, but maybe, you know, depending on your perspective. But I think Wacom would be more critical of what, what is happening, but they are not involved. So that's an example of a, a, a community-based organization, which has really international connections too, but still remains a, a, a critical voice in the context of Ghana, but are somewhat excluded from this wider assemblage. So when I think of an assemblage, um, there's some sort of organizations that are excluded and they are mostly critical voices that tend to be excluded from this bigger 
um, we can call it neoliberalized assemblage of some sort, uh, looking at who is part of this and who is involved, right? So it, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, we're trying to tease out, okay, is, is there a lot of community-based organizations at all that are really playing a role? And we didn't really come across an, a lot of them because majority of them are not endowed, they don't have the funding. So they come up and they do a few things and then they dissipate. They are not able to sustain the work that they do. I think unlike South Africa, you guys are able to have sustained, you know, critical, strong voices that are able to continue doing activism um, against um, all sorts of activities that you deem not beneficial to the people. But in the context of Ghana, I find that that sort of sustained activism is not as widespread as, as I would expect it to be um, in, in most of these communities where I do my research. Thank you for, for this response, uh, Professor Andrews. If I can uh, take another uh, person to engage with uh, Professor Andrews. Okay, let me just ask a, a question. Um, uh, there is artisanal mining. Um, how are they situated in this uh, assemblage? That's, that's a good question. And I've done some work on artisanal mining. So there's a way in which I, we can actually connect all kinds of extractive activities to this bigger assemblage that we, we're discussing in this paper. Here, for, for this particular book, um, we were looking at just oil and the assemblages that are part, that I'm, you know, part of it. Um, I think for artisanal mining, it's really interesting because there's a, there's a, there's a component that is seen to be formalized. And then there's a component that is characterized by the government as illegal mining, which I question because like who really made it illegal? Um, and it's because of neoliberal regimes that really sought to distinguish between who becomes formalized and who becomes ostracized um, to, 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 to the back burner. So that, that has informed what is happening on the ground. And you can see in the context of Ghana, it, there is still a very much globalized assemblage around that external artisanal mining, because one of the things we've encountered in the past few years is the you know, involvement of foreigners in, in what would be considered an indigenous activity. Um, so you have you know, people from Japan, from China, from you know, Latin America, everywhere in, in the world actually coming in, but majority from China because of the connections that Ghana has with China um, and, and coming in and taking, and also because the, the, the gadgets that they would use for mining um, are usually coming from there. So they, they, there's already that connection. So they come in, they take up a piece of land and then they, they, they mine, but it has, it has, it really does have devastating impact on, on the environments, right? So even though people are supposed to be doing it for their sustenance, and I've written a paper where we are, I was arguing that people are actually doing it for survival, but also as a form of resistance to state form of mining or to sort of large scale mining, as a form of resistance to all these interventions that are not really benefiting people, right? So that's the sort of a way in which you can theorize that, which I have. But I also think that there's a real impact on, on, on the environment for the wider populations that are not involved in this activity. Um, but in terms of an assemblage, I would say that, yes, there is an assemblage, but this book actually didn't focus on artisanal at all because we are sort of really trying to look at just oil alone and see even how oil alone itself has all of these tentacles, right? So even we're to bring in, you know, large scale mining, artisanal small scale mining, then it would, it would even be much more complex. And that would be, so actually, that's a good point. That's actually an interesting thing to, to consider how extractivism and the entanglement of extractivism um, as, as a whole, and not so much just one sector of, of, of the extractive industry. Okay, thank you, Professor Andrews. Maybe you can uh, follow up on the artisanal mining in, yeah. in your second book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, if I can take another uh, engage, engagement, um, another, if anyone wants to engage the professor, is quite knowledgeable in the area of uh, oil assemblages in Ghana. Let's make use of him.
see Professor okay. Kalima has his hand up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing. Okay, uh, uh, Prof, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan Ford. And uh, Prof, uh, my question is just uh, a question of uh, maybe elaboration. So I don't know if it's a question or if it's a, it's a comment from you. I, I mean, you did mention the issue of international um, NGOs that seem to have been co that are co-opting local communities or NGOs uh, to do their, what we can call dirty work, right? Um, you didn't say it that way, but I'm just thinking in my head, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you fund all of these. I mean, you, you did mention who's funding what and why they're funding it. They come into a space um, and it's kind of a camouflage for participation and, engage, and, and engagement, but it's not really participation. It's actually not even engagement from what I, you know, the subtext, that's what you're pretty much saying. I don't know. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, what are the ramifications of that? Because um, it seems to me that if you don't have, if, if local communities and uh, who are impacted by these extractions uh, of minerals in their, in their spaces are not re don't really have a voice, you know, uh, and then you have uh, so-called NGOs or international NGOs that are parading around, uh, playing a role of, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have been consulted, but we have been paid to be consultants. I don't know, is that what you mean? So that's, that's, that's partly what I meant by, so when I mentioned the Western region, um, Coastal Foundation, for instance, which is funded by the DFID, what they're supposed to do is stakeholder engagement, right? So, and, and I mean, it's a problem because if you, you're funding an organization to just do stakeholder engagement, um, what happens if that funding dries out, right? That means is stakeholder engagement not going to happen again? Um, what would the people do? Because the people would have engaged and they would have had, you know, I mean, I think engagement does happen to some extent. But for me, I think it's about how you sustain that engagement over time for, for the benefit of the communities that are being engaged and not just maybe checking a box that, yes, you got the funding, you organize the forum, and so people are engaged. But you actually see what really does it mean for engagement? Because when I was speaking with people, well, yeah, we go to these meetings and they're actually wealth you know, big resorts they go to for these, some of these engagement activities. They leave with some money in their pocket. I'm like, well, giving that particular person who was representing the community the money um, is not going to feed the community. It's not going to help with the broader community that you're trying to help, right? So I think that the engagement seems to be very selective. And so, and it's not sustained over time. Um, and most of these organizations, DFID will not fund you for eternity. They will fund you for 10 years, maybe five um, or 20 it will still dry out. So for me, my, 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 the, the argument we're trying to make, well, how do we sustain these things? How do we make sure there's some sort of grassroots momentum being built that, you know, that there, there will be engagement happening, there will be people feeling they have a voice, even beyond um, what is currently happening. And again, like you said, people are being paid to, to do these things, to consult and to engage. Um, what happens if no one is actually being paid to facilitate these engagements? Are people still going to be engaged or are just people going to be you know, left on their own, and then that's it. We just leave things as they are, right? So that's always the challenge with having, you know, all these organizations encroaching on on on, on this space, um, because they, they they would engage, they would do something for a, for, for a moment, and then they they would they would they would, they would leave, and then blame the government or blame the state or blame the communities for not doing something even though they would have started a particular thing that they dropped, right? So again, it's just sort of blame game that is being played where we always sort of look inward when the problem happens instead of really looking at both inward and outward because everything is connected to, you know, a, lo a lot of um, different actors and, and, and different assemblages. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Andrews. I think it's uh, past uh, five o'clock now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we need to conclude. Um, if uh, can invite uh, Shona to give us our last words and uh, we can bid our, uh, our speaker goodbye. 
Thanks so much, Stanford, and thanks, um, Professor Halema. It was lovely to have you. Um, Nathan, thank you so much. We know that you got up at the crack of dawn to engage with us, and um, I, I would like to keep in touch because you know I, I'd like to have more discussions with you. I do hope you'll join us on other CCS platforms, though. And to everyone who joined and participated, thank you for coming. Please join us next week. We've got Pasha Madavi, who is talking about um, debates around nationalization, also related to this idea of the resource curse or perhaps we're now going to rethink about using this term resource curse um, lightly um, as we've now engaged with Nathan. So please join us next week for that and please keep safe everyone and we will see you. At the, so just to say next week's seminar is not on the Wednesday, it's on the Thursday, but same time, same platform. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Chona, and everyone. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye bye. Thank, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Bye, Edmund. Bye. bye.